It's my esteemed honor to be here and to share in what the Lord is doing in this church and in this conference. It's been a tremendous last several days to be in your nation, to be in your community, and to be in your church. You are blessed with the greatest leaders, with the best heart, and the greatest anointing that you would find anywhere. And I would encourage you, if you have not put your shoulder to the plow and to let the Lord use your talents and your time and your creativity in helping to build the house of God here at Salome, you need to surrender all and let the Lord work through you because this is a tremendous work that is happening here. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to look with me in Genesis chapter 26. The first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 26, verse number 19. You know, several years ago when everybody brought a Bible to church and you would say the book to turn to, you'd hear the sound of paper turning. <laughs> now we all have our Bibles on our phones and we don't hear that sound of paper too. So I'm just assuming that you're opening your phone not to look at Facebook or the score of the soccer matches, but you're looking at the Bible. After the death of Abraham, Isaac moves his family into Gerar in the land of the Philistines to endure a famine. And while there, God blesses him abundantly. How many know the word says that Isaac sowed in the time of famine and God gave him a hundredfold. But Isaac's blessing wasn't received well by the Philistines. And not only do they stop up the original wells that his father Abraham dug, but they run him out of town. And Genesis 26 verse 19 says this, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac and said, the water is ours. So he named the well Essek because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sitna. And he moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. And he named it Rehoboth, saying, Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. Rehoboth in the Hebrew means room enough. Would anybody here this morning like God to do a blessing in your life? where you just step back and say, God has given me room enough. There is more than enough. Abundant supply, abundant joy, abundant finances, abundant health, abundance in my family. Now, living in the outskirts of Gerar, in the desert area, away from the city, Isaac digs two wells to try and find fresh water in the desert. I don't have to tell you how challenging that would be to be in the desert area and try to dig out wells by hand without modern machinery to try and find fresh flowing water in the desert. And both times that Isaac and his team dig out a well and manage to find fresh, clean water, the enemy Philistines take over the wells and say, that's mine. There's so much tension and there's so much strife over these wells of water that Isaac names the first well Essek, 
meaning dispute. And he names the second well, Sitna, meaning opposition. Think about how much arguments, how many problems, how much division, how much heartache and betrayal that there has been for him to name the water dispute and opposition. And now the child of promise, Isaac, is sitting between dispute and opposition. No doubt Isaac being told of all of the prophecy that's been spoken over his life that his father and his mother would tell him the times that the angel of the Lord would visit and, and declare promise about Isaac and tell his father to look up and to see all the stars of the heaven. And Isaac has heard all of his life how God's hand was on him and how he is a child of promise. And now his life is sitting between dispute and opposition. He's not living between goodness and mercy. He's living between dispute and opposition. And probably Isaac is thinking, if I'm really blessed, then why am I struggling? If God is really with me, then why is it every time I work really hard and dig something out, the enemy comes and takes it? If I really am the person that God has promised and said is blessed and there's all this prophecy and prophetic words spoken over my life then why is everything my hand touches get taken by the enemy rather than get blessed is there anybody here this morning that has ever wondered questions like that if God really loves me, then why is life so hard right now? If God is really with me and if I'm really blessed and if I'm really blessed going in and blessed going out, if I'm the head and not the tail, if I'm blessed in the black basket and blessed in the storehouse, then why is life so hard right now? Where's the breakthrough? Where's the joy? Where's the love in our home? Where's the health and healing in my body? Where's the promotion? Can I tell you what happens to most people? What most people do when they dig something out? Anybody know what it's like to work hard and dig something out? You put your shoulder to it and you dig out a career. You dig out a good marriage and a family. You dig out a business. You dig out a church just like this one. You dig out a ministry. You work hard and you sweat and you pray and you give and you believe and you digging something out little by little by little only to have to walk away from it because the enemy shows up in the middle of it and takes it and says, that's mine. What you've worked hard to try and build and create, that's not yours. The enemy says, that's mine. Most people, when that happens to them, not one time, but like Isaac, two times. Can you imagine digging out a business two times for the enemy say, no, I'm taking it. Digging out family two times for the enemy say, no, 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 it's mine. I'm taking it. Digging out ministry, digging out your job, digging out your finances out of a difficult place. Two times, only for the devil to say, no, I'm taking it right back. That's not yours. You can't have that blessing. Most people, after the enemy takes what they dig out two times, they'll do one of two things. Many people but then begin to believe they change their doctrine. They change their belief about God. And they believe now that it's not God's plan for them to have a well of fresh water. It's not God's plan for them to have blessing in their life. And we change our songs from songs of praise and songs of victory and songs of joy. And we change our songs that we sing to ourselves to sound like, woe is me. All I have is trouble. And it's not God's will and not God's plan for me to have good, good things. And we start to look at other people and say, God wants them blessed, but he doesn't want me blessed. 
God has willed for them to prosper, but he hasn't willed for me to prosper. We change our doctrine, Pastor. We change the songs that we sing because the enemy has come and taken our well. The other thing that many people do is we compromise and we settle in and we drink not from the well of refreshing, but we drink bitter waters of dispute and opposition. Rather than trust God for something next, rather than trust God for a new thing in our life, we just drink of bitterness and become a bitter person. You probably don't know any bitter people. Just sour. They look like they've been baptized in sour lemon juice. There's probably no sour Christians at this campus. You don't know, don't look at the person sitting on your left or your right right now. You just need to look straight ahead. Don't look at your husband. Sour people. <laughs> Sour people. You better not ask them how they're doing today. You don't have enough time for their answer. They're going to tell you everything wrong in the world. And if it's not wrong, they're going to make up a reason why. They'll just make something up. Sour people. They're not going to praise God with you when you have a blessing. They're bitter over the things that didn't go right in their life. What do we do when Isaac has his second well that is stolen from the Philistines? He could have said, well, I've worked hard and... God must not want me to have a well. Or he could have just stayed there and become a bitter, angry, sour person. But instead, Isaac takes a third option. Verse 22 says, Isaac moved on from there. Isaac moved on from there and dug another well, can somebody in this service this morning shout out these words, dig again. dig again. I am here to encourage you this morning to get your spiritual shovel out and dig again. Dig again. I know that you have worked hard in your life and the enemy has tried to steal things from you. I know that you have trusted God and prayed and labored and served and given offerings in faith to see miracles and breakthrough happen in your life and in your family and in your finances. And just when it looks like everything is going well, then the devil wants to show up and say, nope, you can't have that. I know it would be very easy for you to lay your shovel down and say, I'm going to give up. I'm not going to try anymore. I'm not going to believe God anymore. I'm not going to get my hope up anymore. I'm not going to serve in the church anymore. I'm not going to pray and believe God anymore. I'm not going to get in the Bible and trust the Word anymore. I'm just going to surrender and hope that the enemy will have mercy on me. But God has brought me here to tell you this morning, it's not time for you to give up. It's not time for you to be bitter. It's not time for for you to be sour. It's not time for you to change the word of God to fit your struggles. It's time for you to get the shovel out and dig again. Dig another well. Dig another well. The Bible says when he moved on, then he found Rehoboth. Everybody wants Rehoboth in their life. Everybody wants to get to a place where we discover God's favor and God's blessing where there's abundance and provision and no more struggle and no more strife. Everybody wants that, but few find it. I'm going to tell you how. How do you find Rehoboth in your life? Here's the first thing you need to know. You'll never find God's room enough for you if you're still drinking from dispute and opposition. I can't get a new well 
if I'm still drinking from the old one. I don't know about here in Johannesburg, but in America when we have deep buckets, wells, water, we'll have this long spoon, long handle spoon called a dipper or a ladle. There's a lot of God's people, many of God's people, that we have our dipper in bitter waters. And we keep drinking from the well of yesterday's struggles, yesterday's betrayals. We reach down in the memories of the pain and struggle and betrayal and disappointment, heartache of last year, five years ago, 20 years ago, a generation ago, the struggles of our grandparents and the struggles of our parents. And that's what we nourish ourselves in is the memories and the struggles, the pains of yesterday. God can be blessing today, but we don't drink from that. We don't feed ourselves from that. We get our dipper and our ladle and we reach into the wells of of bitterness and bitter waters and we nourish ourselves from the pain and the struggle of yesterday friend if you are going to discover God's Rehoboth for you in your tomorrow you need to leave the dipper behind today and stop reaching into old wells of sorrow and struggle I know that you worked really hard only to lose it I know those people promised you that they would love you and be loyal. I know you invested a lot of time and a lot of money and lost everything. But if you're going to get to Rehoboth, you've got to move on. You've got to move on. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, For we live by faith, not by sight. And the faith component is that you must walk away from old wells before you discover the new. Isaac doesn't find Rehoboth while he's still at the old wells. He has to leave the old wells first. You have to give up the bitter before you will ever discover the fresh. And so many times we can say, Lord, I'll give up my sorrow when you bring me joy. And he says, no, 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 no. You repent of that. You turn from that and I will lead you into joy. Trust me, Abraham, you get up from your father's land and you walk to a land that I will show you. You have to trust that the Lord has something new for you that maybe you don't see it yet and your mind has not comprehended it yet, but I will walk away from the bitterness and the sourness of the pain of my past and trust that God has something new for me tomorrow. How do I discover Rehoboth? I trust God, that the water will flow again. Think of the miracle. Think of the faith required in that. You're in the desert. And you dig and find water. You're not easily going to want to walk away from that. Because what are the chances that you're going to find water a second time? And then you do, and the enemy comes, and now you have to walk away again. How can I know that I will find water a third time? You will never get to the Rehoboth, the abundant blessing that God has for you by the end of 2024 unless you can get yourself full of faith and remind yourself of the faithfulness of God. 
Remind yourself of the faithfulness of God. Just like David said, I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or God's seed begging bread. Remind yourself that it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That in his right hand is joy and pleasure forever. You need to remind yourself of that you've been feeding yourself bitterness and sorrow and struggle and the lies of the devil. You need to remind yourself of the good goodness and the faithfulness of God. He's been better to me than I could be to myself. He has been better to me than I deserve. I didn't make any of this. It wasn't my hard work. It was the grace of God. It was the goodness of the Lord. Had it not been for the Lord who is on my side, my enemies would have swallowed me up. The same God that can protect Noah in the flood. The same God that can provide quail in the wilderness, the same God that can make the barrel of oil not to run out, the same God that can provide for Elijah at the brook Cherith, he can make water to run in the desert one more time. And I want somebody to know, maybe it's your third time, maybe it's your tenth time, maybe it's your one hundredth time, but he is the God who brings streams in the desert and he will make the water to flow your way again. He'll make healing flow your way again. He'll make love flow your way again. He'll make joy flow your way again. Your boss, your employer doesn't control the water. The government doesn't control the water. The United States doesn't control the water. But the Lord who sits high and looks low and has all power in heaven and earth, he's the one that makes the water flow in your life. Look at somebody sitting next to you and say, dig again. Get your shovel out of the closet. Get it out of retirement. And dig again. Serve again. Pray again. Dreams are starting to come alive in somebody's soul this morning. I can feel it. I can feel it. I can feel it. Businesses are going to be started out of this service this morning. I can feel it. People are going to come up to this man of God and say, Pastor, it's time for me to serve in the church again. It's time for me to lead again. It's time for me to be a man of God again. I've been bitter and I've been hurt and I've been sorry and I've been feeling sorry for myself. But it's, there's one more well for me to dig. There's another well for me to dig. He dug a third well and there was no more struggle. But listen, the story's not over. Isaac went and dug a fourth well. Why would you do that when you finally got what you've been wanting? Look at verse 23. From there, Isaac went up to Beersheba. And that night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you and I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. And Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. And there he pitched his tent and there his servants dug a well. Meanwhile, now watch this, watch this. Who's the person that kept giving Isaac problems with his old wells? Abimelech. Abimelech. Now, Isaac has went away from there, and he's dug a fourth well, and Abimelech had come to him from Gerar, to Gerar, with Ahuzath, his personal advisor, and Fecal, the commander of his forces. And Isaac asked, why have you come to me? Isaac's really thinking, I thought I got rid of you. I thought I never had to see your sorry soul again. And here he is. And they answered, we saw that the Lord was with you. What God's going to do in some of your life, even your enemies are going to have to say, I can't deny the blessing of the Lord. 
Can I tell you, we've seen that in our church in the last several weeks in Kentucky. People who had left and walked away and cursed us. When the blessing of the Lord is there, they come back and get in the altar and cry and repent and say, I've hated you and I can't live that way anymore. He said, we saw clearly the Lord was with you, so we said, there ought to be a sworn agreement between us. Between us and you, let us make a treaty with you that you will do us no harm, just as we did you no harm, but always treated you well. He's a liar still to this day. And we sent you away peacefully, and now are you blessed by the Lord. Can you imagine what's going through Isaac's mind when he is, has his shovel in the ground and is digging out one more well, wipes the sweat from his brow, and looks out over the horizon and sees that same old enemy coming one more time. Whew. I have to tell you today, for many of us, there are people in your life you thought you will never have to deal with again. No, 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 no. There are people you thought they are just a memory, but God has a way of bringing things back around. Abimelech shows up again. God's, listen, listen, listen. God's blessing on Isaac's life creates the opportunity for conversation where there used to be conflict. Isaac in this moment, when Abimelech is coming to him, after the blessing of the Lord is on his life, Isaac could be rude. Isaac could be mean. Isaac could be snarky. Do you know snarky? Now we, we specialize in snarky, sarcastic in Kentucky. Isaac could have got the ladle back out and served them bitter waters. But understand something, friend. When your Abimelech comes back around, it's a test. It's a test. After you get to Rehoboth and your Abimelech comes back around, it's a test to see what do you want more. Do you want revenge or do you want blessing? Do you want to prove a point to that person or do you want the blessing of the Lord? Do you want your flesh to feel good for a moment or do you want your spirit to be glorified for eternity? Look what that, look what a, Isaac does. Verse 30, Isaac then made a feast for them. And they ate and drank. And early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other. Then Isaac sent them on their way, and they went away peacefully. And that day, that day, everybody shout that day. Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug, and they said, We've found water. They had only been working hard when Abimelech came back. And Isaac stopped and prepared a feast for his enemy. Only after he prepared a feast for his enemy did they find water where they had been digging. I am convinced that if Isaac had cursed his enemy they would still be digging today and find no water. But the moment he loved and blessed his enemy, his servant said, hold on a minute. There's water flowing one more time. What if the reason the water of God's blessing isn't flowing in your life is because you are cursing your Abimelech and not blessing them? Oh, that's not a word you want me to tell you today. Your flesh doesn't want to hear that. But it's what your spirit man needs to hear. Everyone has an Abimelech in our life. And as much as you would like to think that you'll never have to talk to them again, never see them again, they will never show up on your Facebook feed again. 
They're coming back. They're going to be at the family holiday. They're going to be at the work meeting. And here's what someone needs to hear. How you handle your Abimelech determines how quickly the water begins to flow. God has fresh water rivers. Rivers. You're believing God for a trickle and he says, no, I have a river. He has rivers that will flow in your life. But it's held up waiting for you to release blessing on your Abimelech. Here's the last thing I'm going to tell you today. Look what these men did, Pastor. They had a treaty and an oath. They're saying this. We're doing something today that's not about me and you. It's about generations. That what we are moving in today, we're moving out of strife and moving into joy. We're moving out of sorrow and into peace. And it's not about this moment and these two people. It's about my house and your house. It's about my family and your family. It's about generations. Here's what he's saying. My children will not growing up, will not drink from the bitter waters that I've drunk from, but they will drink from fresh living water in Jesus name. Can you stand with me across the house of the Lord? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your spirit that is here today. I thank you for your presence. You're speaking to us today. You're speaking. You're speaking, Lord. You're speaking. There's some people in this room that it's time for you to dig again. Maybe you were married to Abimelech. Maybe you sat next to an Abimelech at church. Maybe you work beside Abimelech and it's been easy for you to have excuses to be bitter and be sour. But today the Holy Spirit of God has revealed your heart and told you it's not time to give up. It's time to dig again because God has fresh water to flow in your life. 